So this Sunday we start the Advent season. Advent means the arrival as we celebrate the birth of Christ. And so this Sunday and then the next uh, four Sundays, Christmas being on, uh, or Sunday being Christmas Day, uh, Christmas Eve will celebrate uh, the last part of the Advent season. And so as you think about Christ and you think about the birth of Christ, uh, in Christ there are multiple gifts. Obviously, God, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. We got, we got that part down. <clears throat> but there are multiple gifts in the gift of Christ to us. And one of those that we're going to look at today is hope. Next week we're going to look at love and then joy and then peace through the series. But one of them today is the area of hope that, that Christ gives us hope. Today's going to be a little bit of a different message. It'll be a little bit of a history lesson uh, through the Gospel of Luke. And so it's not one, point one, point two, point three, a joke and send you home. We're going to kind of take a bu- bus tour through. But I think, I think you'll appreciate the history behind it and the hope that we have in Christ. Can you follow along today? Yes. All right, so here's a little confession for all of us. How many of you, and if your kids are sitting next to you, you don't have to raise your hand because we... They, they need to know that you're perfect, okay? How many of you, when you were teenagers or children, and mom and dad were out of the house, and it was around Christmas time, and you knew where the stash was at, right? You knew where they hid all the presents. How many of you went in and did a little bit of exploring of what's going to be? Wow. Wow. You guys are terrible. <laughs> terrible, right? All right. How many of you, how many of you, when you found the stuff, actually played with it? Anybody? Just, just a couple. All right. All right. There's the top of the class over there. All right. Let's see if we can keep going. How many of you who played with it broke it <laughs> and actually put it back in the box? And when Christmas or Christmas Eve happened, you open it up and you go, Oh, mom, it's broke. Can we return it? Anybody do that? We had one guy this morning in the early service. He had his like, yep, that was me. All right. <laughs> so <clears throat> so I, I did uh, one guy, and it wasn't me. All right. I did two of the three. I didn't do the third one. I never broke it, but I did find it, and I did play with them for a while. And uh, I, I think I was like 17. But anyway, you know, I was still, still pretty young and young at heart. All right, and then here's what I learned about Christmas, too, as a, as a parent. Remember when you were a kid, and it was like you would go, you know, trick-or-treating or, you know, harvest carnival, whatever it was that you did for the Halloween time, and you would go, and you would do all the candy stuff, and then it seemed like it was like a blink of the eye, and then all of a sudden it's Thanksgiving, and you're eating turkey and Thanksgiving stuff, and it was though so fast, and you as a child, you're looking forward to Christmas, Right? And it just slows down, right? And it doesn't seem like it ever gets there. And I can remember asking my mom, how much longer, mom? How much longer? And I think I was 19 then. And she would take me to a calendar, and she's like, honey, see, you got to go to sleep. 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 You know, and she'd do a little thing. And then there, and I'm like, oh, that's going to be like forever, right? And it felt like it was forever, And then as a parent, is it forever? It's like, yeah, we're going to the church, the harvest carnival. Woohoo, cut the turkey. We got to put these things together. It's Christmas tomorrow. We got to hurry up. Anybody pull the all-nighter putting it together, right? Look at the directions like, who made those up, right? How does that work, right? It's impossible. (laughs) Then you get up in the morning, they're like, Dad, how come you look like you're up all night. You're like, Mom, I have no idea. Just I didn't sleep well. I was so excited for Christmas. And you're up all night trying to figure out how to put the widget together, and it's a nightmare. Well, as a kid, Christmas takes forever. But here's what I want you to think about today. Imagine that you had to wait 2,000 years for Christmas. Imagine that your great, 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 however that is for 2,000 years, granddaddy, said, God made a promise to Abraham. And God's going to bless the earth through Abraham. And the whole world is going to be blessed through the Jews. And you waited, and you waited, and you waited. See, we know that unless the Lord returns on the 25th, 
we're going to celebrate Christmas. We know that it's certain. But imagine if you didn't know that. Imagine you weren't sure. And you've heard generation after generation after generation tell you, but God's going to do it, but God's going to do it, but God's going to do it. And you waited and waited and waited. Today we're going to talk about hope, the very top of your outline. Let's take a look. Hope is theological. Hope is personal trust in God. Hope is what you think God can do. So hope isn't, you know, I hope that I get a job. I hope that I win the lottery. I hope that the Raiders win. I hope that the 49ers win. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's like beyond God, right? And as a Raider fan, it brings nothing but joy to my heart to see you flounder 49er fans. All right. Let's move on. Here we go. Because for years we floundered. For years we invented ways to lose. And finally, hallelujah, we got a team that can actually play. All right? Let's just go home. Good night. <laughs> so we're still hoping for the A's too. Well, never mind. All right. So, so, so hope isn't that we just hope that something's going to happen. Hope is actually theological. It's based in what you believe God can do. It's based in what you believe in a personal trust in what God's able to do. Number one in your outline, and this is like a bus ride, so let's just walk through today, okay? A little bit of a history lesson. There were always a handful of Jewish people who hoped every single day for the arrival of the Messiah. So they believed in their heart of hearts that God was going to answer the promise of 2,000 years ago, and God was going to send a Messiah, and the whole earth was going to be blessed through, through the Jewish people. They believed that. And there was just a small group. Now, many of them through the years of the 2,000 years peeled away, and many of them got into other types of different beliefs, and they got in, in, into the Greek, mind, Greek mindset and the Roman mindset, and they walked away from the worship of, of Jehovah, and they just began to kind of do their own thing. But there was always a group of people who believed that every day they would wake up, they would look with expectance. They would believe that the arrival of the Messiah was going to come, that God was going to fulfill the promise of the 2,000-year-old promise that he had given. Number two in your outline, why is it relevant to us in our life? <clears throat> At some point in our life experiences, God seems to be quiet. God seems to be so inactive. We look around and we say, why should I hope? Why should I keep on believing? For every one of us, whether you're a new follower of Christ, you've been a follower of Christ for a long time, there are seasons in our life, there are situations in our life, there are circumstances in our life when we sit around and we don't wonder if God is going to answer our prayer, we wonder if God is even hearing our prayer. There are times in our life where we don't sit around and hope that God's going to do something tomorrow we wonder if it's the, it's the story that people have said that he's some old guy in heaven on a rocking chair that senility is set in. He doesn't even know what day of the week is, let alone know who we are. And we sit back and we wonder, are we wasting our time? Are we just going through a fairy tale belief that there's a God who exists, who wants to know us, who wants to have a personal relationship, who wants to send in hope in Jesus Christ into the world? Or are we just wasting our time? There are seasons in our life where all of us will go through those times, where we scratch our head and we wonder, God, are you even there? Are you paying attention? Are you listening? Acts chapter 1. Luke begins to tell a story, and it's interesting because it's a backstory to the real story, right? So it's kind of like a warm-up warm act, right? And so he's going to talk about two people who are incredibly faithful to God in the midst of a time where God is silent, and it's going to lead into hope, Jesus Christ being born into the world. And what's interesting about Luke uh, and his account is he tells this backstory because the backstory really gives us a glimmer of hope that's going to be born into this, into this world. And it gives us a little bit of a picture of holding on to and hanging on to the hope that we have in our life. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Here we go. 
In the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abacab. No? All right. His, his wife, you remember Ab- Abacab, that song? No? All right. <clears throat> his wife, Elizabeth, the, the first group got it. The, this is the corrupt group. You guys are the ones that steal the Christmas presents from your parents. But his wife, Elizabeth, also was a descendant of Aaron. So we'll just pause right there. So you have Zechariah and you have Elizabeth. Both of them are from a long line of priests. So he is a priest, their dads were priests, their granddads were priests, their great-granddads were priests, and so there would be a bunch of priest kids, not preacher kids, because they weren't preachers then, but they were priest kids that were lining up. Well, Zechariah and Elizabeth both came from that line. So they would have heard the religious stories that God gave a promise to Abraham, that God was going to fulfill it. And they also, we'll get in a moment, they also heard some stories that were not so good about what God wasn't doing. And so they would have heard them all. And Luke begins to paint the picture of their heritage and understanding for us to understand the backstory of the history of what he is ultimately leading into. Verse 6. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. And so if you were to follow them around and you were to look at Elizabeth's life and Zechariah's life, you would look at them and no one would be able to go, I think they're up to no good. I think they're shady. I think they're cheating. I think they're corrupt. They would live their life in a way that would be honoring to God. They would have followed the commandments. They would have followed the regulations, which there are a slew of them. And they would have been basically good, decent, God-fearing, loving people. All right? So you got the picture of that. Okay. You got the picture of it. All right. Number three. So for 700 years, all right, our country isn't even half that old. For 700 years, God had been silent. For 700 years, they heard from their daddy and their granddaddy and their great-granddaddy who were priests. This is what God said to us. Nothing. The prophets weren't speaking. There were 700 years of silence. And yet those two would get up day after day And they would live their lives as if Christmas, hope, was coming. They would wake up and they would go to the temple and they would do the religious duties and they would follow God and they would seek God. And day after day after day, they would follow Him. And for 700 years, they would have heard stories that God was inactive. God isn't speaking. God isn't doing what He did when the prophets were were alive. And they would be reminded that you are holding on to a promise of something that's 2,000 years old. You're believing that God is going to do something through the Jewish people, that God is going to send a Messiah in. And for that 2,000-year promise and for 700 years, God was completely silent. And yet they would wake up every single day seeking and following God blamelessly in their life. Verse 7. And it gets worse for them. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren. In those days, in that culture, women had very little rights. They were typically uneducated. Uh, They had no political standing. Um, They basically, they had two basic jobs. One, take care of their husband, and two, have kids. That was it. And they believed that if a woman wasn't able to have kids... It was because God had cursed her. And so when someone who wasn't able to have kids, they didn't have the technology that we have, and and if a woman wasn't able to have kids, the people would look around and they would look at her and they would say, I wonder what she did wrong to get God mad, to curse her. And there was a great deal of shame and there was a great deal of guilt because, after all, the the woman's priority was take care of her husband, have children. That was primarily it. And here she was, she was a God-fearing woman, she was blameless, and she would wake up day after day after day believing that God was going to do something in her life and through her life and for her nation and for the world. And yet, she would be without a child. 
gets worse. And they were both well along in their years. She wasn't 20, she wasn't 30, she wasn't 40, she wasn't even 50. She was well past childbearing years. And so not only was she not able to have a kid during her prime time of childbearing years, but now she's old and now the desire of wanting to have a kid was, come on, are you kidding me? It's not going to happen. I mean, it's, 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 it's all over. And yet every single day, they would get up and they would walk into the temple and they would walk into the community and they would serve God and they would love God and they would love their people and they would walk in a way that was blameless to them. Number four, they had prayed, and we know this later, they had prayed the desperate prayer for, for a child. And God had said with a real loud, no, no child. And yet, they would get up and they would keep believing they would keep hope in their heart. They would keep believing that God was faithful, even though it was a 2,000-year-old promise, and even though it was 700 years of God being completely silent, they would still believe that God was active, that God was awake, that God was alert, that God was going to do something in and through their life. Number five, their hope in God was based on a promise made to Abraham 2,000 years earlier, and I gave you the, the, the verse there, Genesis chapter 12, verse, <clears throat> verse 2, and it's a longer verse than that, but that just kind of gets you a starting point, and it says, I will, uh, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and that verse goes on, and it says, I will curse those who curse you, and I will bless the nations who bless you, and just as a side note, this is U.S. government right here, 101, the reason why the U.S. government has always been a supporter of Israel is based on that verse. The verse is that we believe that if we would watch over and protect Israel, that we would be a blessed nation. And that was where our, our view of protecting Israel uh, actually came from. And so that verse goes on, and it says that God was going to bless the world through the Jews or through Israel, through Abraham's promise to bless them. <clears throat> and just a quick little survey through the New Testament or Old Testament. You ready for this? So here's what happened. Obviously, God gave, uh, gave Abraham a child who had a son, who had another son, who had a bunch of sons, who had a whole group. And there was a time where they moved into Egypt and then they moved into the promised land. God had done some amazing things through the Jewish people, the Israelites. Uh, he gave them Abraham and David and Samuel, who were just phenomenal leaders. The country thrived. The, the industry thrived, the wealth thrived. They became a powerhouse and a power broker in world government at that particular time. And then after Samuel, things began to get a little bit sideways. And from Samuel to Zechariah, I think that the country had changed leadership like 25 times. And they went from great leaders to horrible leaders. And they were just bad. They didn't love God. They turned their back on God. They went from having a great army to no army. They had went from having great wealth to no wealth. They became uh, where they were big players in the world scene to basically being uh, an occupied territory by the Romans. And so it was really kind of an interesting time period because they began to digress in it. And if God was going to send a Messiah, he would have sent it during Abraham, during David, during Samuel, they were at the pinnacle of their country. That was at the highlight of who they were. If God was going to bless the world, it would have been then, and he didn't. In fact, it was worse. In 65 BC, the Romans came in, and they marched into Jerusalem to take them over. And the Jewish people believed that they had, they had a, a, a place that was called the Holy of Holies, and it was a place where God would dwell. And so you would go in there and it would be typically one person. It would typically be the chief priest who would go into a place like this. And it was so sacred and so holy that if there was any unconfessed sins or if there was, no, if there was not the right sacrifices made to God, that God, when they walked into the holy of holies, God would strike them dead. And so they would tie a rope around the chief priest's leg. And they would have bells around the robe. And as he would walk in to do the sacrifice on behalf of the people, they would listen for the bells. And when the bells stopped ringing, they would start pulling it because the, he just got struck dead. And they wouldn't want to go in there and rescue him because they would be struck dead. So they would drag him out by a rope, pulling him out 
out of the Holy of Holies, right? And in 65 BC, the Romans not only occupied the area, they went into the Holy of Holies and they desecrated it and they marched around in the Holy of Holies and even worse than that, they walked right out of the Holy of Holies and people began to believe that the Roman God, little g, was more powerful than Yahweh because Yahweh would have struck them dead if they walked in. And these guys walked in, marched around, did whatever they did, and they walked right on out, and they lived. And the rumor was Jehovah God, Yahweh God, must be inactive. He must not even be real. And they began to question whether existence was even true. And Zechariah and Elizabeth knew the story because their dads were priests. And they would have known because their dads would have come home completely devastated that the temple had been desecrated by Gentiles and that they had walked in and they made a mockery of the Holy of Holies and they just walked right on out and they would have known that. And yet, they would wake up day after day after day and they would serve God based on a promise 2,000 years ago, based on the idea that God had been silent for 700 years And they would continue to follow and they would continue to believe that God was going to do something. Number six, they would have asked, as we would have asked, why doesn't God act? Is there any hope? Is there anything we can do? God, why don't you strike them dead? God, why don't you impact the world? God, why don't you do something? And the reality is, if we had an opportunity to whisper into their ears, there would have been a moment where they would have been weak, and we'll see that in a moment, but their answer would have been, we believe. We believe that hope is coming. We believe that we worship a God who keeps His promise. We believe that He is going to fulfill all that He said. And there would have been that moment of, I'm not really sure, But overall, they would have said, it isn't a fairy tale. It isn't a myth. It isn't something that someone made up to try to control people, to keep them under control. And that's what we hear in our world today. Come on, are you kidding me? You're going to go to church. You're going to hear about Jesus. You're going to follow that Bible thing. That's just a way of controlling humanity. It's not real. You're wasting your time. It's a joke. He's not active. He's not alive. He's not well, and we hear the cat calls, and so did they, and they would have watched their family members walk away. They would have watched them join and get involved in secular religions, in the Greek religions, in the Roman uh, religions. They would have watched their loved ones say, you guys are going to the temple again? (laughs) Good luck. I hope it works for you. Number seven, Luke begins with this story because this is the beginning of something brand new that would ultimately result in the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. And Luke begins to tell the backstory before the story to give us the idea that hope is coming. And even though it's a promise 2,000 years ago for them, And even though there was a 700-year period of God being silent, that these two set the example to us, Zachariah and Elizabeth set the example to us that they were going to keep on believing. And they were going to hold on even when it didn't seem like it was possible for them to keep on believing. Number eight, the reason why this matters to us, and again, coming back to what I said earlier, there are moments... There are periods and there are seasons in our life when we wonder, is God active? Is God listening? Does God care? Is there any hope? And Christmas, a few weeks away, Christmas is the answer that hope has come. And it's a reminder to us of that. And this backstory, this history lesson that we learned today in the first few verses of Luke, is a reminder 
that even though it may be a promise of 2,000 years, and even though there are seasons in our life where we wonder if God's even listening or paying attention, or if he's somehow in heaven lost and confused, God is alive, and God is a God of promises, and he will see us through. Verse 8, once when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was serving as a priest before God, verse 9, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord to burn incense. And so there were 23 divisions of priests. And so each of the priests, there would be lots. You know, you pull, you ever play the game where you pull the biggest, the longest straw wins or the shortest straw wins? Well, the priests believed that God was in that. And so they would have a uh, a lot, uh, uh, and each of them that would pull their lot, and based on who would get that magic one, would be the priest that would go in to do the burning of the incense. It was something that, in many cases, priests would serve their whole life and never get the opportunity, because they believed that God hadn't chose them to go in to be it. And so, in this case, <clears throat> Zechariah selects the lot. He gets the one of the lots that's going to go in to do something that's incredibly sacred. It is an honor to God. It is like, it is, you know, the grand poobah of being able to do things for God. This is it. You get to go in and you get to burn incense, incense before God. Verse 10, and when the time came for the burning of incense, uh, come all the assembly worshiped we're outside praying. He's the only one in there, right? He's in the place where God's going to dwell. He's getting ready to do the lighting of the incense. Verse 11, and an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense, okay? Now, just kind of pause. This is kind of side commentary. In the early 90s and the mid-90s, angelology was huge. Maybe you guys remember that. People were writing books about angels. People were seeing them all over the place. It was the big thing on all the Christian TV. It was all about angels. And everyone would talk about, oh, it's beautiful, and she was marvelous, and he was handsome, and they had wings, and they floated around, and all this other stuff. And here's the problem that I have with that. The problem is, in the New Testament, that isn't the case. In the New Testament case, every time someone appeared, uh, uh, every, every time someone saw an angel, their first response was, oh, she's beautiful. By the way, there's only men angels. That's another thing for you to look at. Oh, he's so handsome. Their first response was, yikes. They were scared out of their wits, right? And the first words that you would see, you can go through the New Testament when they had the angels appear. Typically, the first words from the angel is, do not be afraid. All right? So sometimes we go, oh, man, it'd be cool to see an angel. Of course, on Sunday, you see me. That's just as close to an angel. So I'm like a second cousin to one, all right? All right, maybe not. <clears throat> so Zachariah saw him, and he was, what was he? He was startled and was, yeah, and look what the angel said, verse 13. But the angel said, do not be afraid, Zachariah. Your prayer has been, what has it been? Prayer. And just pause. I know there are seasons in my life, and I'm just being honest with you, and I get the theology. I understand that God hears my prayers. I know all that stuff, okay? But just as a human side of me, there are times in my life, circumstances, situations, I, I, I don't, it would be nice that God would answer my prayer, but sometimes I just wish that he would whisper in my ear and say, I heard you. Sometimes that would be enough because you're laying there, you're praying, and you're crying out to God, and you don't hear anything. And sometimes I just wish he would say, I heard you. Not yes, not no, not maybe, just I heard you, Dan, right? And so the angel says to Zechariah, God heard your prayer. He heard your prayer. And the verse goes on, verse 13. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son, and you will give him the name John. He's going to be John the Baptist, for those of you who know in the New Testament. And he will be a joy and a delight to you, and, and, and many will rejoice because of his, bir uh, his birth, verse 15. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He, will never, uh, he is never to take wine or other fermented uh, drinks, drink. 
<clears throat> and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth, verse 16. Many of the people of Israel, he will bring back to the Lord their God. Why would he bring them back? And the reason why, in your outline, the reason why that John the Baptist is going to bring them back to the Lord is because God had been silent for 700 years. And when God is silent in our life, we lose hope. And they lost hope. And many of them would peel away. And many of them would be, begin to follow other gods and other secular religions. And they would walk away. And the angel said to him, Gabriel said to, to, to Zechariah, your son is going to bring them back. Your son is going to bring in hope into the world. You with me? Verse 17. And he will go before the Lord. He's going to be the forerunner of Jesus. He's going to blaze the trails in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient uh, to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? That's the moment of doubt that he had. Even though he believed, even though he, he believed that God was going to, there's that little hint in his life uh, to the angel, are you sure? And, and I think that in our life, I find it encouraging, <laughs> but also discouraging too. There are times in our life where God is silent, where God is inactive, and we wonder, God, is that you? Are you going to do something? You have that moment of unbelief in the New Testament. Remember the guy, Jesus said, hey, your son's going to be healed. And he said, yeah, that's great. Help my unbelief, right? You ever feel that way in your life? And here this moment, Zechariah has this just little, little glimpse of, are you sure? And then he says, why? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. He's well past her childbearing years. Verse 19, the angel answered, I am Gabriel and I stand in the presence of God and I, will sen uh, and I was sent to speak to you to tell you this good news. Verse 20, and now you will be silent and unable to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my word. So there's the one, the one drawback there, uh, which will uh, come true. And then here's a key part. It will come true at their proper time. Just pause. You mean, God, 700 years of silence? You mean a country that had spun out of control? A country that was focused on you and worshipped you and it was a powerhouse and it was blessed financially and it was blessed for resources and it was a world power? And through that 700 years, it kind of spiraled out of control. And people walked away from God. And people began to worship other gods. And people said, it's a fairy tale. Come on, Abraham, 2,000 years ago, are you kidding me? It's a joke. You're wasting your time. You mean at that proper time? You mean like God had on his calendar on a wall and he said, this is the day that I'm going to send John the Baptist into the world? And the answer is, yes. He has a day in which he's going to do it. But God, you felt like you were inactive. It felt like you weren't listening. It felt like you were distant. It felt like, <laughs> are you even real? And the reality is, he was active. And he was real. And he was a God of a promise. And they may not have seen it, but it was his exact time in which he chose to do it. Number 10, there is an appointed time, and God had not stopped paying attention at that proper time. And there are times in our life where we wonder, God, where are you? God, is this even real? God, is it true? How come you didn't answer it yesterday, God? I can't wait till today. I want it yesterday. And yet he has an appointed time in each of our lives, to do different things. Verse 21, 
Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, wondering why he was staying in the temple for so long. They probably thought he died. Probably thought they were getting ready to pull the rope out and pull him out. <clears throat> he came out, and he could not speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision uh, in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. And that's where Pictionary came in? That was, that's where it was vented, right there. You just draw something, and so he's drawn it, and like, an angel. And he's like, <laughs> right? So that's it. You go home and you read on the small print. It says Hasbro Brothers, Zechariah, and Elizabeth. Right there. That's where it was invented. You didn't know that. You've been playing a very godly game. Good for you. Uh, where are we at? What's what? Verse 23. And when, uh, when, his, when his time of service was completed, he returned home. Verse 24. And after his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, uh, pregnant, and for five months remained in seclusion. Verse 25, she says this, The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and has taken away my disgrace. You wonder why. It's because the, the community thought she was cursed by God. And so it had been taken away. Her disgrace had been taken away amongst the people. And then in verse 26 is the real story. Verse 25 and, uh, and verses 5 through 25 is really the pre-story to the real story. It's just a history lesson of two people who believed God is faithful, who believed hope was going to be born into the world, who believed even though there were 700 years of silence that God was still going to do it. And it says in verse 26, and in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to the town of Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And there is the real story, but verses 5 through 25 is the pre-story to begin to give you a glimpse into the hope that we have because we serve a God who is a God who keeps his promise. And even though there may be seasons and even though there may be times where we scratch our head and we wonder, God, are you even there? God, are you even going to hear us? We see that it was simply a warm-up act to what God was going to do. Number 11 in your outline, here's our dilemma. And this is a struggle that we all face. And if you're not facing it now, I hate to tell you this, you're going to face it next year, and it's going to have questions in your life where you ask, do I stay or do I go? Is there hope? Is there, is, is there any hope? Is God listening? Is God going to hear my prayer? Is he going to answer it? Do I walk away and stop believing the fairy tale that God exists, that God loves me, that God pursues me? Do I believe? Do I stop believing? Do I walk or I do like Zechariah and Elizabeth, and I remain hopeful even when it doesn't seem like there's any hope. Do I stay in there? Do I keep on believing? Number 12. In, in difficult seasons, we have to decide whether or not I will remain faithful in spite of the facts. For them, it was 700 years of silence. For them, it was a country that once was a powerhouse to being a country that is occupied by, Roman by the Roman government. From them being a place where everyone would worship Yahweh to a place where all their friends and family, not all, but many of their friends and family, would walk away from them. And would say to them as they would get up in the morning and they would walk to the temple, you're wasting your time. Why are you doing that? you got so many other opportunities to do stuff. Why are you going and why are you serving a God that is silent? And you're following a 2,000-year-old promise and it is an absolute joke. Number 13. Welcome to the world of Zechariah and Elizabeth. A couple that decided they were going to walk blameless before God in spite of what they've seen, what others said, and the fact at that time that they could not have any kids. And here's the challenge for us today. 
Number 13. The challenge is, will you be faithful in spite of what's going on? So let me just ask a couple questions. As a student, you look at the school, you look at what the kids are saying, you look at the, what everyone's screaming and they're saying, you know, why would you follow that God part? That's a joke, man. Do you realize what you're missing by not fill in the blank? Are you going to remain faithful? Maybe you're in a college or a young career position and you look at the corporate ladder and you look at uh, the way that people are progressing up the ladder and getting ahead. And the world cries out, cut the corners, come on, don't be faithful. This is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Just do what you got to do. If you got to step on someone, bummer for them. Are you going to remain faithful? Are you going to walk blameless? Maybe as a parent, you sit and you look at your marriage, you look at your relationship. It's not good. There's little hope. Do you remain hopeful? Do you believe that God can? You look at your finances and someone says you got to be disciplined. You got to follow the, what, what the scripture says about your finances. And you think, I'm never going to get out of debt. Why should I even try? Why don't I just claim bankruptcy and get it over with? Why even do it? Are you going to remain faithful? Are you going to walk blameless? Maybe the doctor said, doesn't look good. I don't know. You should get your family together. You should have a meeting. It's not hopeful. Are you going to remain hopeful in there? See, that's the challenge that we all have in seasons in our life. That are we going to remain hopeful in spite of what's going on? In spite of what the expert says? In spite of what the doctor says? In spite of what whoever says? Are you going to remain hopeful that God can? And Elizabeth and Zechariah was a picture of two people who believed it was hopeful when everyone else was screaming, it's a waste of time. And God used them to birth John the Baptist, to be a forerunner of Christ, to blaze the trail for Jesus to come into his earthly ministry. And there would be a day where John the Baptist would point to Jesus and he would say, look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away of the sins of the world as he enters into his earthly ministry. And all of us are going to have seasons and times in our life where we're going to wrestle with, are we going to remain hopeful? Number 15, Christmas is a reminder that our faith and our hope is not in vain. That our faith and our hope is not in vain. Christmas is a reminder that God is a God who keeps his promise. And God sent hope into the world to bless the world. And the one thing that he asked of us is, will you trust my son Jesus Christ to be your Lord? And he sent hope into the world. And hope, or Christmas rather, is a reminder for every single one of us that God is a God who keeps his promise. And what you're up against today or what you may be up against in the future where you wrestle with, do I remain hopeful? Christmas is a reminder that hope entered into the world 2,000 years later and after 700 years of God being silent, but God was faithful and he fulfilled his promise. Let's pray. Father, <clears throat> as we gather today, and as we just get a little history lesson into Elizabeth and Zachariah's life, Lord, I recognize that there are moments, there are seasons, there are times in our life where we wonder, are you are you even, do you even exist? Are you active? Are you alive? Are you alert? Do you pay attention? And Father, as we celebrate this Advent season and the Christmas season, may it serve as a reminder to us that you are a God of hope. You're a God who keeps your promise. And that as we sit here today, even though there may be seasons and times in our life where we feel distant 
from you, you are still active and you still are pursuing us with your love and your grace. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you've never given your heart to Christ. You've never trusted Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And I want to give you that opportunity to do it. We do a little ABC. A is admit that we're sinners, that we've all made mistakes, that we've missed the mark. B is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, <clears throat> that he died on a cross, that he rose again. And C is to confess him to be your Lord and Savior. And if you're here today and you desire to invite Jesus into your life to be your Lord and Savior, as I say this prayer, just silently repeat after me. Just say silently, Lord Jesus, today I admit that I'm a sinner. I made mistakes. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross, that he rose again. And today I confess him to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me a new heart, a new mind, and a new life. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Hey, I mentioned the communication card. On the back of that communication card, there's a box there that says Becoming a